Hi, everybody. Welcome back again for another edition of the podcast that accompanies Skin on Skin, the rise and fall of the world's largest furrier. Today, my guest is somebody who, if you've seen the documentary, or even if you haven't, and you've seen the um, trailer for it, which we'll show to you right now. Who doesn't love a rags to riches story? But a rags to riches to collapse story? There were two Evans Furs. The one that climbed to the top of the highest peak, amazing story. And the one that tumbled from that peak decades later. But that's not the tragedy. The tragedy is what happened in between. They lived the American dream. And they let a lot of people come in and live it with them. And it was a wonderful story until it wasn't. Coming from a, a generation that was so driven and willing to work 18 hours a day to be successful, there aren't that many people like that anymore. They, they created something out of whole cloth, and he helped kings and queens around the world with their fur coats. That was the era, uh, I would say, the golden era of department stores and specialty stores. Genetics loads the gun, but it's the environment that pulls the trigger. Non-existent parenting, and so they didn't learn how to cope with stresses. And I just look at the damage that my father created and the things that he has said. But it certainly caused a, a significant rift in the family and families and, and you know, a number of us didn't communicate with each other for a long time. You marry into the family, you marry into the business because that is your life. Clearly, there were problems. So if you've seen that, you see this lady's plastered all over the film as well as participating in it, Jennifer Meltzer, who started off as a model uh, and that's how she found her way to Evans and then into the family and everything. But Jennifer, welcome. And first, why don't you tell us, before we start talking about the film and how we feel about the work that we did on it and everything, tell us about what it was like modeling in the 70s. And the that this is like the 70s and early 80s. This is like the, you know, the, the supermodel uh, era is um, booming right upon us at this time. This was definitely the time of the supermodel. And I wanted to model ever since I was seven years old. So my father always knew it was my dream. Growing up in a farm town of 2,300 people, I, I, wanted, I did everything possible to gear myself to that. And when I was accepted to go to Manhattan and be involved with a modeling agency, I got scared. And I, and I said to my dad, I don't think I can do this. I'll stay home. I know I can get the best scholarship anywhere because I've got straight A. And I, I just, he says, you're going. He says, you are, this is what you've wanted to do your whole life. So you are going. So lo and behold, the first week I was in Manhattan, I was photographed by Women's Wear Daily walking down Lexington Avenue because that was it. So Manhattan was tough. New York is a tough ball game for models. How'd you make your, how'd you make your way to Evans? Oh, yeah, so how did you make my way to Evans? It, it, it was a slow process. My way to Evans was moving to Chicago. I got involved with a really, really good agency in Chicago, and I was booked for several days at a catalog studio called Cranston, just banging out one after another cloth coat. The, the cloth coats for Evans could have been 
with a little bit of fur on them, but it was because Evans also had besides furs ready to wear. So bing, 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 bing. Okay, so that you'll see one of those. I mean, that was I think the twenty nine dollar coat or something like that. So that was that was Evans. And then from then on, I started working more for Evans as a print model, which was great. So along the way, I'm. I'm I'm moving up the ladder. I mean, I'm making a lot of money. I made $150 an hour. My day rate was 1500 to 2000 This was Chicago. And that's in the 70s and 80s, too, everybody has to remember also. Right. But, exactly. So by the time I was 24, I bought a three-flat apartment building and had my own car. I had my own two fur coats from God knows. I mean, I had shopped Evans. Um but there were other furriers in town, and it, you know what, whatever I got. Okay, so then one day I was also asked to do one of Evans' commercials. Good morning. You missed it. Oh hi, no messages, but you missed it. Today. Don't worry, you didn't miss it. You wouldn't dream of missing it. Well, this was before it was, they were with an advertising agency. So I did a commercial with for Evans. And at that time, I got a chance to meet Mr. Um, Mr. David Meltzer. <laughs> so that was the beginning of the Evans thing, but that that just kind of moved along. And then, as far as meeting more of the Evans people, I think it was probably with a couple years later when Drury Lane East opened. Evans put on a huge choreographed fashion show, and it was the opening. They invited all their, I mean, all their clients. Everybody from the store was there. It was two days of rehearsals. Jeffrey was <laughs> fitting the models and trying coats on girls. Like, could you rem just remember how sweet he was? I just can't explain it. I'm so wrapped up in love. And I just can't contain it. All wrapped up in love. We're so wrapped up in love. We're just wrapped up in love. Big smile, right? You know, he'd be calm and they, you know, it was it was fun. So between um between rehearsal time, because we weren't all rehearsing at the same time, because there were several different segments, obviously, even though it was an unbelievably beautiful show. Bob was sitting up in the bleachers and just kind of dark and quiet. So I had a chance to sit and talk with Bob for a while. And we just, we really hit it off. I mean, we really hit it off. It was very nice. Nice guy. We had the same ideas about a lot of different things. So meanwhile, the show went on. It was great. It was televised. It was choreographed the music was amazing uh the choreographer came in from manhattan and uh show tunes at the end there's all this fake snow that falls the guests were treated like kings and queens with drinks and everything i mean it was a grand opening for drury lane east in a water tower place so this was the style that evans did so i'm gonna let you go well, let's fast forward a little bit so you and Bob end up married, and you're in the company, and now you're doing extensive modeling for the business. So uh, tell me about that. With that experience, I mean the modeling part, because the rest we'll save for the film. Um, the modeling experience, what that was like, was there ever any talk about that you're being oversaturated or we're oversaturated on one end, or was there any talk on the other end of creating any sort of, uh, I don't know, personality or story to be telling with this gal who's in almost every ad that we do? No, 
No, because actually I wasn't in almost every ad that you did. Evans was in the newspaper, both newspapers, every single day. The um, Obviously, the Sun-Times and the Tribune loved Evans because, hey, if you don't advertise, you don't get people in the store. So they used a lot of uh, and again, especially back then, this is before computers, so advertising oh, was everything. Absolutely. And again, I mean, the whole industry has changed. I mean, even in, obviously, even in the model world, because everything is on, I mean, everything is on the internet now. I mean, newspapers barely have ads in there, but whatever. Why now? Right now, during Evans Investment Days, save 25 to 60% on fine furs and women's apparel. Exercise your savings options on Evans wool coats, suits, dresses, and sportswear, shoes, and accessories. Save 25 to 60% on the smartest investments of all, Evans' collection of fine furs. Evans Storewide Investment Days, this Thursday, Friday, and Saturday only. Smart buyers will be there because blue chip stock at this price won't be around for long. Okay, so back to Evans. Um... I also was at the top of my game, and I worked for a lot of people in Chicago. And I did everything from fashion shows to hand modeling to commercials. So I was very busy in my own right, not not really relying on Evans. When I got booked for Evans, it was my business name, Pogat. It wasn't Meltzer. I was booked through an agency. It was very professional. So I know you're doing more um, acting and modeling today, but from what you know and what you hear from friends and whatnot, the, the game's really changed, right? It's not as, it's like, it's either you're at the top and lucrative or you're starving, probably, like many industries. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But, but also, if a woman, especially now, takes care of themselves, through the decades, and I was actually written up in the Malibu Times for how many decades has this model been working, right? There is work, and there will be work until I die. That's how great the L.A. market is, as opposed to maybe the Chicago market, because the Chicago market is pretty much flattened out, and I would say Chicago has become a food and sports town more than fashion. The warmest of holiday wishes from Evans. There's a lot of things that have changed there as well. Right, right. Well, I worked in Chicago. It was it was shocking to me the changes. Oh, it's in it all. It's altogether different town. It really is. Let me fast forward. Let's go talk about the film a little bit. Um, so uh, fast forward to what we we're talking about nine or ten months ago, eight months ago, whatever it was. <clears throat> what did you think when it first came to you with this cockamamie idea of exposing both our family story and its secrets? I was literally married to the business. I mean, you marry into the family, you marry into the business because that is your life. Well, at first I was a little reticent, I must say, and I wanted to get approval um, as you and I spoke, I did. And then I sort of jumped into it because it's like, you seem so good at what you were going to do. And then when the story unfolded, it just became more enticing and more of something that I really, really wanted to get involved with. Who doesn't love a rags to riches story? But a rags to riches to collapse story? Well, let's see what you think after hearing this tale. There were two Evans Furs. The one that climbed to the top of the highest peak, amazing story, especially after the situation these siblings were put in by their parents, 
and the one that tumbled from that peak decades later. Didn't you find it? I found it interesting for me that one of the most interesting things was how at the beginning it was really going to be a story about the company and the rise and fall of the business. But the more I talked to family and the more I dug into the family history with family and non-family as well, quite frankly, it took on this life of its own and became about people and relationships, as most stories do, right? It, it Well, especially when you're dealing with um, such a powerful family that is such a historical part of what has happened in America. So I think that alone makes it so interesting and so historical. And then all the other different layers make it even more interesting. Uh, Rose was a spinster. She was 29 years old when she got married. Her brothers bought her a husband. And she had three kids. And I don't know which one of them or both of them decided they wanted to come to America. But Rose would only come first class. And it's, it was, it's, like I said, it took on a life of its own. So, um, so, so then, uh, now that you've seen the thing and you've seen the final thing and, and, and have looked at it, you know, what, what do you think of what we've done? And, 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 uh, how, you know, thinking about that. And again, the, the differences from, from whence we began. In fact, the other day I was looking at, um, you know, like versions one and two of where the thing started. And it's almost laughable now. Who doesn't love a rags to riches story? But a rags to riches to collapse story? Well, let's see what you think after hearing this tale. There were two Evans Furs. The one that climbed to the top of the highest peak, amazing story, especially after the situation these siblings were put in by their parents. No, but you know what? I'm I'm really proud to have been a part of it. I'm very, very proud. And I think what I would like to know more is going back to Rose and Julius in their in the country. I mean, where they came from and maybe a little bit more of their history because they brought a lot with them. I mean, they had already had three kids, which is pretty interesting. But some of the, I'd like to lo know a little bit more about what happened, but I think that's probably... Probably not too old. <laughs> it, well, it's not. It's probably not too good. It's hard. That's the, there's so much information that that was astonishing to me. That was also hard to come by. My understanding is is that this was influenced by their mother, who was a serious depressive. There, and I think part of it was is that there was no room in those days to talk about it. And you know, I think it was a it was stigmatized. Um, mental, you know, any kind of mental health challenges and, um, and you know, the proofs of the pudding. But, but clearly, I think you're right, because um, one of the things I think you discover is that this didn't all start with Rose. This probably goes back before her. And, um, you know, even, and, and yes, she was a, a spinster and they had these, you know, brothers who wanted to get rid of her and whatnot. But the, I know. But something happened before that. Like, you know, um, when I was seeing a therapist after my sister's uh, passing, who, who we talk about in the film a lot, um, you know, one of the things she used to always keep saying to me is to let go of some of my pain and anger towards my immediate and, 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 and cousin family of the present, because this goes so this goes back generations. You have no idea how far. And guess what? I've sort of been told the same thing a few times, uh, probably by about three different people. <laughs> so there's it's sort of out of our control, Scott. And right, what happened to Rose before she even came, God only knows. Julius seemed, I liked Julius. I liked him a lot, from what I know. But I like Jewish men. <laughs> So, so as the thing again, as I said, as the thing took on a life of its own and and started to become more of a people story, with a business bent on it instead of just a business story. What did you think of when we brought in uh, uh, some professional psychologists and to, to do that analysis for us? Absolutely the best, and the two that you brought in were outstanding. I like I like both of them a lot. They both brought in different different ideas of what was going on and what happened. I liked them.
What gets my attention about bros is a dynamic we call in psychology and sociology entrapment. And that's where somebody outside yourself makes some fundamental decisions about how you're going to live your life. You could say, okay, she was acting out and she was feeling sorry for herself. And okay, that might be true, but what she needed was some attention. Someone to say, what's going on, Rose? What can we do about this? Yeah, there's some really fascinating perspectives there, don't you think? Very, very. I, I think I have played this over and over so many times and listened to both of them. And they both make so much sense. And they're both such grounded, beautiful people. Yeah, no, they were both great, great help in putting this together. So let's talk about going forward a little bit. So there's two more parts of this. And, and specifically in the next part, um, and here, let me show, let me first show the trailer for the next part, part two, even though you, okay. many of you haven't seen, most of you haven't seen part one yet, but we showed you the trailer for part one. Here is the trailer for part two. Julius and Rose Meltzer went forward with the belief that their son's death was an accident. And this setback rocked the family during a time when brother A.L. and Herman's Evans Furs was skyrocketing to the top of the industry. Those Meltzer kids obviously weren't taught how to cope or how to parent or, or, you know, relationship skills were really lacking and that got passed down. DNA really plays a role in, in any, you know, in anyone's well-being. All I know is that he had a photographic memory, he was brilliant, and the family loved him. So she was always, you know, like, I was her little doll. She loved, but she was very interesting and fun and vivacious. All of his grandchildren wrote reports on Nuremberg at some point in school. You know, someone would always have an assignment, interview some relative about something. Nonchalantly would toss a question out and the, the Beads of sweat were pouring off as he's trying to answer Uncle Bernie's question. A lot of people live in fear that, you know, oh my God, is that going to happen to me? In the end, a lot of people got hurt. A lot of customers got, got hurt because their coats weren't there. And, you know, it was, it was just a bad thing. Not for nothing. We were supposed to be life. You know what I mean? We were following, you know, that suit. I'll never forget it. He threw this dinosaur, you know, toy dinosaur on the table. And he says, this is what Evans is. And you know what he happened to these dinosaurs? That wasn't what the legacy that he wanted for himself. He didn't want to wake up and smell the coffee. So he just... You know, he did the things that he enjoyed doing. Okay, so um, so now we're going to talk about the things that we didn't talk about in part one of the film, and starting with the, the, the last three of the children uh, of Rose and Julius who weren't spoken about in the film, and that would be Bernie Meltzer and Jack Meltzer and Edith Meltzer, two of which, the, the, the last two, are two of the tragedies that we didn't get to in the in the first part. I know. God, I mean, this can this can just go on. I mean, I always heard about Jack, but I everything was sort of like put under the table. Bernie, a doll. I mean, all I can say is what a sweet, intelligent, loving man. I, he, he just I just loved every minute I was ever around Bernie and his gorgeous wife, Jean. I just, I mean, they made me feel so good about myself. So I think just by, you know, the setup of the second film being, um, as I said, about these, the other three children, as well as the actual downfall of the business during the uh, times of the anti-fur movement, as well as some issues internally within the company, it looks like we're set up for another roller coaster ride here in part two. Oh, absolutely. Oh, my gosh. Okay, so the last three children. So it was Jack, 
whom we really don't know. Well, I don't know a whole lot about. I'm still digging before uh, you know I start putting the second part together. But there is such limited information. It's real. I don't want to get into anything that's going to be in the film. But they're it's really they're they're hard to find of of anybody in the family. Right, right. Well, someone has to know. <laughs> well, like I'm I'm digging into the high school and then the the car okay. the university thing to even just to get pictures because you know, nobody I have pictures of everybody in our family except him. Nobody has a picture of him. So and I have pictures of his parents, our great you know the great grandparents. So okay, um, oh okay. So Scott, so it was Bernie, Jack, and. What was the other? Edith. Oh, okay. All right. So Thelma came from... Thelma's in the first three. So what's interesting about the whole story, again, without getting too much into the story, is that the first three survived the, you know, the abandonment and the depression that dripped down from the parents. What? And that's not the, what you'll see in part two is that's not the same with the second three children. Oh, my goodness. No, no. So this is, again... This makes it all the more enticing and interesting because we do want to find out more. I mean, this is this is history, but why, 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 why? Right? Well, been, but a lot of the whys won't be able to be answered, and that's just a part of life, okay. also. You know, right. because again, we're talking about generations, generations, generations back. But you know, somewhere, somewhere way back there, and maybe it's twenty generations ago. Who knows? There, there is an incident that shaped all of this that just, as as the, uh, Dr. Whitman said in the film, that's genetics loading the gun, and then it is. in the environment that follows, whether the trigger is. is pulled or not. Ab absolutely, it is. And I have certainly read several books about things like this, too, and why people have to move away from situations if they possibly can when they don't have control. In a lot of cases... Like Thelma, she couldn't move away from it. So uh, there's just so many different parts of this other than just the story of Evans. So let's go back to the film that is finished and tell, why don't you tell everybody as um, somebody who was involved in his production and whatnot, uh, more more intimately than many others, what do you think of the final product that we turned out? I think it's absolutely great. I mean, again, I am very, very proud and honored to have been a part of it. I certainly hope in the future I can do more with you, Scott, because I think that you are on a roll. And obviously, I will do everything in my power to get it out there as well, because I think it is a film worth watching. I think it is very interesting, and I think thus far it it's pretty great. Well, it's a, it's a story worth. I think it's a it's a story worth telling, right? There's some very interesting parts of it, but B, I also think. Um, it's an interesting discussion and analysis of depression and anxiety and suicide. And then uh, three, it's a, obviously an interesting industrial story of this amazing empire that came out of this and, you know, and, and what it took to create that. And um, again, as one of the psychologists in the film said, what kind of mania it takes to that. That's the response to the parental abandonment as opposed to the other extreme, which was those that didn't survive. Oh, for sure. I mean, it, not only parental, I think in every kind of relationship. So, I mean, I think a person, if they are just constantly feeling like they're controlled, they rebel. She gets shuttled off into a life she doesn't want. What happens with that, You um, emotions are contagious. If you're living with somebody who's unhappy, who resents uh, a decision, you know, look, we're going to Boston, I've got to be separated. That's felt within the family. That's felt within the kids. And I don't know about you, but, you know, the film hasn't been uh, screened to, to a number, to quite a few people yet, but, and it's about to, especially at some of these film festivals we've been accepted to. But, um, you know, but, but, you know, I look back on it, and again, I, I, I see something that um, has so much more texture and flavor then I had any idea of what I was getting into. Um, that again, initially this was, you know, I worked in this family business that quite frankly was, a, you know, as much as I had a great time, it was also a disaster for me in my life at the time because it kept me from doing things like this, you know, making films that I wanted to do that I'm doing now. 
Um, but it was also a necessary part of my development, right? So one of the things we said wow. in the film is if I had to do it again, I probably would stupidly choose to do it again um, because the good parts did outweigh the bad. And I, I hope that comes out in the film also, along with all the heaviness and drama. I, I think it will. And you know what? Listen, life isn't over. You've got a lot more chapters to live and you can just keep going. I mean, if this is your dream, then you've got to do it. My dream started at seven years old. And thank, I mean, I thank God every day that I've been able to do in my life what I wanted to do. And that's an important part of the film too, right? Is it's about these people not being able to have dreams or having dreams and having them crushed. And, and that oozes out of the film as well. Well, and that's probably one of the reasons that David Meltzer felt like Superman. Because he not only conquered his dream, he blew it to a degree that made him feel like Superman and feel like that he could really kind of control everybody around him. So um, that's there. I mean, you have that element as well. So on that note, which I think what Jennifer's saying, which I will totally agree with her is, <laughs> um, as you have the chance, make sure you see the film. It's Skin on Skin, The Rise and Fall of the World's Largest Furrier, uh, coming to a theater and or streaming service and or something near you soon. We have been accepted in some film festivals, so you'll start seeing it there, and we'll see what kind of legs this thing has. But regardless, we are doing part two and part three, and this accompanying uh, podcast series, and there's a script to go with it for, a, for a, a limited edition biography series also. So who knows where we'll land. That's right. Remember, just keep it going. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Jennifer. Jennifer Meltzer, thanks for your time. Everybody, I'm Scott Hunter. Thanks again for joining us on the Skin on Skin podcast for the support of the movie. Have a great day.